as we normally do, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Father who is in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful day. Thank you for your Shabbat. The holy day we can come to your house, worship, bless one another, hear from your word, and just enjoy this day to be set apart for the rest of the, the work week. And Father, I pray as we come to your word this morning that you would just enlighten our hearts, open our hearts and our ears so that we may hear what you have to say. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav, la'asoch b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who, in his, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. All right, well, bruchim abayim, uh, welcome to Beth Adonai and our 10 a.m. teaching. We're continuing our series on who are we in Messiah. This is part four. You can find the other three uh, archived online at our website at BethAdonai.com. And so we're continuing this, uh, this teaching, this understanding of who are we in the Messiah. Uh, we stated several times throughout this series so far is that this was an important theological point in uh, Shaul's mind, uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, alone, just the Apostle Paul, excluding any of the Gospels or any other writings, used this particular phrase 73 times. So obviously this was very important to him. And so we're going to continue looking at it. Most, most of the time up until this point, we've gone through the book of Romans. He used that phrase, in Messiah, 15 times in the book of Romans. Um, but we're going to continue on in, into an, another part of his writings. And, and discovering our identity is important. Discovering our identity is important. Because without identity, there's no purpose. There's no destiny. There's no goal. There's, there's no reason for us to exist, really, if we don't have an identity, know who we are, where we're going, and what we're doing, okay? This world now, this world in its system, its God, Hasatan, is standing at the ready to give people an identity. He is. He's ready to give people an identity. All, all one needs to do is search on the internet, internet about self-worth, self-identity, self-acceptance, and there are a multitude of seminars that one could attend to help achieve a sense of self-worth and identity. There's a longing in each si inside of each person to belong to something. We all have this, uh, this, this, this um, longing to belong to something, and Hasatan is waiting with the ready-made answer to those who aren't aware of the spiritual aspect of life. Okay? He knows what's going on. It is a very powerful motivator for the reason why people do what they do. Why people do what they do is because they're looking for a sense of belonging. They're looking for a sense of self-worth, of self-confidence, and that is a very big factor in, the, in, in motivating people to do things. Especially in our society, in the Western world, the push is to tell men they really are all right. After all. And that what identity, worth, and meaning they find in life, they must find in and for themselves. We are told in this society to think of ourselves and are shown how to get on top by using and manipulating others. By intimidating before being intimidated. We're told how to be successful and how to be number one. We are counseled to find meaning in the heritage of our family or our ethnic roots, roots with the expectation that finding out we, where we came from will help explain where we're going and perhaps where we're headed to. But these things only give a superficial sense to cover up a deeper spiritual issue. And that deeper spiritual issue is who we are. Where did we come from and where are we going? But these, these things that the world gives us, it doesn't help remove the underlying problem in the meaning of life. Okay? The world is ready to give you answers, but all it is is what we call a placebo. 
A placebo is basically a sugar pill, and they trick you into thinking that it's something else, and, and you start feeling better, but absolutely no, uh, no substance to the pill. Okay? Others set about trying to establish their self-worth by becoming heavily involved in their work. Okay? You ask most men, uh, what do you do? The first thing they're going to do is tell you what their job is. This is me. I'm a truck driver. I'm a teacher. I'm a security person. I'm a this. I'm a that. Okay? Uh, some even get involved in a congregation in order to receive praise and commendation. And before long, they're entrapped in the same system as the rest of the world. We're working to gain identity. What we do and how we do it then becomes our identity. As a person... Uh, as a person's self-satisfaction begins to grow, as they're doing what they're doing and getting a self-satisfaction, their spiritual lives begin to shrivel. Why? Because such effort feeds the flesh and it cripples the soul. When we're making these efforts to create our identity in anything other than Messiah Yeshua, if, we, if our identity is wrapped up in anything other than what it, it, where the, our identity belongs, then our spiritual lives begin to shrivel because we're putting our emphasis in the wrong place. The only way a person can achieve a true sense of self-worth, meaning and significance, is to have a right relationship with Hashem. It is in Messiah that one finds their identity. Okay, Shaul states in Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Messiah. It is no longer I who live, but Messiah lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, you'll notice in this verse, there's a distinction between I and Messiah. Galatians 2.20, distinction between I and Messiah. He says, I have been crucified. He says, I no longer live. And he says, Messiah lives in me, and I live by faith in the Son of God. Okay? So he's making a distinction. He's telling us that my identity has disappeared. I no longer live. I have been crucified. Me, Lance Hamill, no longer am who I am. I have a new identity. Okay? I have a new father. I have a Messiah that uh, my identity resides in. So it's when we lose our striving to find some sort of, of identity outside of Messiah, trying to, uh, trying to find, out, uh, find our identity in our work, our relationships with other people, finding our d identity in how we look. Are you guys familiar with the whole vampire goth culture that's going on in this country? It's crazy. It, they, they dress like vampires, they go to these vampire uh, parties and meetings, and, and they try to live this vampire lifestyle. Um, uh, how about the whole zombie thing? You got this whole zombie kind of identity culture going on here. And then, and then we have the LGBT community has made their lifestyle choices as a matter of their identity. They, have, they, they don't say, I practice these things, they say, I am this. And they make it a, as a matter of identity. So people try to find their identity in all kinds of things. People want to belong to something to give them a sense of person, uh, uh, purpose, destiny, and longing. That's what people want. This is a God-given desire. However, with anything else that we do, Hasatan is right there to hand you his ideas of what they are, and get us distracted away from what God would have us to, to do, have our identity wrapped up in him. A believer, on the other hand, is a child of God and a joint heir with Messiah Yeshua. If we have no comprehension of those blessings we have, if we don't have any comprehension of those blessings we have, we need to understand our position that we already have in the Messiah. Okay? We need to understand the position that we already have that's been given to us because we are his followers. So let us dig right into our text today that I wanted to start with. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 1, I only have two PowerPoint slides today, so I'm going to have everybody rely on their own Bibles. 
Ephesians chapter 1. In this very text alone, this very text alone, Shalu uses the term in Messiah no less than five times. Uh oh. <laughs> Cha-ching. <laughs> All right. Um, no less than five times does he use the, uh, the phrase in Messiah. It seems as though this concept is very important in Shaul's understanding and his theology in this particular epistle, if he starts his epistle just like this, if he uses the, the text, uh, the phrase in Messiah five times, he recognizes that every word in the Torah points to Mashiach. Okay? I don't know if you guys have heard that before. The rabbis say that every word, every letter in the Torah points right straight to Mashiach. It's all about him. It's all about him. And that is Paul's mindset. That's Shaul's mindset. He understands that everything points to Mashiach. So anything that he's going to bring to us as far as understanding how we relate to one another, how we relate to Hashem, how we relate in our communities and the rest of the world, it has to be wrapped up in who Mashiach is, in the Messiah. Okay, So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 is the place where we will find our first occurrence of this phrase. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in in Messiah Yeshua, okay? So from what I understand in the days, and, and the, uh, the days of the writing and distribution of the epistles, they were read out loud in the synagogues whenever they received them, right? A letter would be circulated around, and whenever it reached a particular congregation, they would get up and they would read this epistle uh, from the author. In this case, it's in uh, the, uh, the congregation in Ephesus, and it was written by Shaul, uh, the apostle. Okay? So, as I was, I was studying for this lesson, and I, I come across this first verse, the, f- the first thing that popped into my head is, can you imagine sitting there in the congregation when the rabbi would read this epistle? And the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Messiah Yeshua. And you knew that you had not been faithful in Messiah Yeshua? So the implication right off the bat would be that the letter wasn't written to you. Or you'd feel rather uncomfortable because you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm giving this to the people who are the saints. I'm giving this to the people who are the ones who are faithful in Messiah Yeshua. And you're sitting there thinking, hmm, I don't know. Have I really been faithful? So I, I don't know why that was the first thought. That's just what came to me, right? So the implica- uh, So I, I know a lot of people use the complete Jewish Bible. Um, my personal favorite that I've been using for over 20 years is the New King James Version. So I'm going to switch back and forth between the two. Um, the version that I read you is from the New King James Version, but the complete Jewish Bible says to God's people living in Ephesus, that is, those who are trusting in Messiah Yeshua. Okay, where it says God's people in the complete Jewish Bible is the Greek word hagios. It's the Greek word hagios, which means different. It means to be different. But it is used in the Septuagint to translate the word kadosh. Kadosh means holy ones, or kedoshim, holy ones. Ones who are set apart for a purpose. And the word for faithful in the, uh, in the complete Jewish Bible, he's saying those who are trusting in Messiah Yeshua is the word pistis in the Greek, but it's trans, it's, it goes back into the Hebrew as naaman, where we get the, uh, the root word aman, where we get the English word amen. Okay? So straight away, Shaul is setting the standard for his epistle. <clears throat> he is speaking to those who are set apart and those who are faithful in Messiah Yeshua. That's who he's talking to. Now the question is, are we included in that? I guess is the reason that that came to the mind. Am I included in that? If I was sitting in the synagogue, and and the rabbi starts reading this epistle from Shaul, and he starts it out this way, I have to ask myself, am I faithful in Messiah Yeshua? That's where I need to be. Okay, so this should be our first clue to identity. Our lives are not our own. We have a purpose, and it's not our own, but a purpose that is different than our own. Right? We have our own purpose, then we have a purpose that's not ours. So it's a purpose that is set apart. 
And that, that's the whole argument that Paul brings about the flesh warring against the spirit. Okay? We'll get into all that. We'll cover that in other teachings. But here's the thing. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Psalm 19.1. Okay? Every created thing in this universe fulfills its purpose for which it was created. Let me say that again. Everything in this universe has, that has been created fulfills its purpose for which it's been created. The sun, I know, I know it's stationary and it keeps burning all the time, but just for the sake of, of, of this picture I'm trying to draw, it rises every morning. It does what it's supposed to do. A bird, it flies because it was created to fly. Okay, An, A cow, it gives milk, it grazes, it does what it's supposed to do. Human beings, on the other hand, we have a tendency not to do what we're created to do because God has given us a free will. Okay, God has given us a free will so that we may choose. And you guys have probably heard this a, a gazillion times in your lifetime, right? We've been given the option of choice because if our choice was taken away to love God, it wouldn't really be love. That's the reason there's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's why there is a choice. Man has the ability to choose one or the other. In, uh, in Breshit, chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, it says, The serpent said to the woman, it's not true, uh, is, It is not true that you will surely die, because God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So knowing good and evil doesn't mean all of a sudden they just became wise and, and started you know, figuring things out. Uh, just because they ate of the, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil. That's not necessarily what that means. Man set apart his own will from that of the Creator on that day that they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When Hasatan, or when the, when the Nechash, when the serpent said, uh, you, you will be like God, knowing good and evil, he's basically saying, you will define for yourself what is good and evil from now on. This is what's going to happen. You've chosen to disobey, and from here on out, you're going to choose what path you're going to want to go down, and no longer just having fellowship with God in the garden. So man set apart his own will to do that, which is different from the will of Hashem. Okay? So when, when Paul is, is giving the instruction to those who are faithful in Messiah Yeshua and to the saints, it means that we are set apart to do a will that is not of our own. Unfortunately, we have inherited something from Adam. Nonetheless, there's a rectification for that. There's a rectification not to be going down the road of our own will any longer. Okay? So why does Shaul use that specific phrase, faithful in Messiah Yeshua? Why not just faithful? Why didn't he say be faithful? To just be faithful to God's Torah. Just do God's word. Why does he, ha why does he use that, that specific phrase, Messiah Yeshua? So I want to take you to a text that will establish for us a very foundational truth. Very foundational truth. First of all, I would like to give Rabbi Shapira, uh, the founder of Ahavat Ami Ministries and Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshivat Shuvu, which is a, uh, is a Messianic uh, Yeshiva in which I attend. Um, he did a teaching down in, in Col uh, Bogota, Colombia, uh, not too long ago, from which I pulled some references and some things from that teaching. So I just wanted to give him uh, the credit for that. So we have a purpose in our lives. We've been set apart for a purpose, and there is a purpose in our lives and a vision for our communities. There's a vision. God has given us a vision and a purpose for our communities, right? And that vision is to ascend up into heaven and then establish the kingdom of heaven down here on earth. That is our purpose, okay? Now, some of you might be going, what? What? are you talking about ascending to heaven descending to heaven only Yeshua does that you know we'll get to that let me explain okay we have a purpose and that can purpose can be seen in Acts 
chapter 13, verses 48 and 49. Acts 13, 48 and 49. It says, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many had been appointed to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. Okay? Very, very, very important uh, verse, passage, to give us an understanding of what our vision, what our goal is, uh, what our purpose is. Okay, there's an important clue here in verse 49, where it says the message was carried throughout the whole land. The Greek word is diaphero, which means to carry through. But in Hebrew, the word is yifrotz, yifrotz. It comes from the word peretz, peretz. If you remember correctly, peretz is one of the children from Judah and Tamar. There were twins that were going to come out, and Peretz and his brother, I can't remember his name right off the bat, but one, one came out and stuck its hand out in order to get the scarlet thread turn, uh, put around his wrist to signify who the firstborn was, but then he withdrew his hand back in and he was the second one to come out. And so his name was called uh, Peretz, or Perez, because... The, the handmaiden that was delivering him said, who are you? Why are you breaking through? You know, She recognized that it was the second one to come out, was the one who stuck his hand out and got the thread. So she called him Breaker. Okay? So basically what we're seeing here in this particular verse in Acts chapter 13, verse 49, it means a breaker. The word broke out. It broke forth. It broke through the land, okay? The word of Hashem broke through the land. This is important because this is our purpose. This is our purpose for the word of God to break out. We don't come to the synagogue here just so we can get a nice little message and then go home and do nothing with it. That's not our purpose for being here. Our purpose to come here is to hear the word of God. We are to ascend to heaven. We are to get the vision. We are to get the, the word of God. And then we are to take it back out into the world. And, and a revival, a, a, um, a, a, a fervency needs to break out within our communities. The word of God has got to go forth. Okay, so the, our vision, our purpose is to get the vision of the kingdom of heaven and bring it here to the earth. Now, how, and how is this done? How do we do this? All right, next, next, uh, next passage we're going to is Breshit, Genesis chapter 28. Chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 28. Here we find the first vision of the kingdom of heaven. We find the first vision of the kingdom of heaven. Verse 12. Verse 12 says, He dreamt, and this is speaking of Yahov. He says, he dreamt that there before him was a ladder resting on the ground with its top reaching up to the heavens. And the angels of Adonai were going up and down on it. Okay? This is extremely important for understanding what our purpose is. First, it explains what a chazon is. A chazon in Hebrew is vision. And secondly, how does one fulfill a chazon? How does one fulfill this? Um, in our text, in our text, where does the ladder extend? Where does it go to? It goes straight to heaven, exactly. The top of the ladder is in heaven. Anybody know the Hebrew? Shemayim. Very good, Terry. Shemayim. Okay. A chazon is a vision of the message of the kingdom of Shemayim. Machut HaShemayim, the, 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 the kingdom of heaven. In our previous understanding, which was mine for many, many years, um, as I was in the church and, and called myself a Christian, the idea of the kingdom of heaven had to do with us just going up to heaven and then just staying there forever. Uh, the, the idea when Yeshua said that repent for the kingdom of heaven at hand just means that God's going to come back and wipe out everybody who's not believers. That's essentially what the kingdom of heaven was. He's going to come and establish his kingdom of heaven here on earth, and it's going to be done through, you know, the slaying of unbelievers and all stuff. That was my idea for many, many years. 
many, many years. It was about me going up on an elevator ride, staying in heaven for a long time, and never coming back down. That's essentially what uh, my understanding was. There was an ascending, but never descending. Always going up, never coming back down. It was always about, are you saved? It was always about salvation. However, the Torah is much more than just, are you saved? There's a lot more to the Torah than just that. Okay, it is a book of prophecy. Torah is a book of prophecy. You know, we often approach it as it's just a bunch of commandments. It's the law. It's things that we have to do. It's do's and don'ts. Okay, but in Deuteronomy 34.10... The Torah tells us this, it says, Since that time there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moshe, whom Adonai knew face to face. So the implication is this, if Moshe is the greatest prophet, then his book, the Torah, must be prophecy. It must be prophecy. And that's how we need to approach the, this, this, this text. We need to approach the Torah as a book of prophecy, and, and Rabbi Shapiro said this, and it, and it made a lot of sense to me when he said this. He said, this is how you approach the Jewish people. If you're going to approach Jewish people about Torah, don't ever get on the level of commandments and laws and instructions, because they'll talk you right into the ground. However, if you approach the Torah from the idea, from the perspective of this is prophecy, oh, well, then you're going to reach them in a whole different way that they, don't, they, they, they haven't approached before. Okay, so this is a book of prophecy. Think about it. Yeshua explained all of the Torah and the prophets to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I think I said this last, last time I taught or before that. I'd love to been in that meeting. Oh, I'd love to hear what he had to say about himself and the Torah. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. Okay, so let's, uh, let's return to Genesis 28. This is a prophecy. This is a prophecy, a chazon, a prophecy of something uh, that, that uh, is to be fulfilled. And the first thing need, we need to ask ourselves is, why is there even a ladder? Anyone? Why is there a ladder? All right. The ladder, the ladder exists to connect Machut HaShemayim, to the earth. It is a connection between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of heaven being brought down to earth. There is the, the, the latter exists because there is a connection. There needs to be a connection. Okay? And how is this kingdom of heaven being established on the earth? What did Yaakov see on the, the Sulam, on the ladder? Angels, right? And little flappy wings, things flying around. No. Okay. One of the things we need to understand, this is, this is, is a prophetic picture, okay? They are mes- messengers. Malach in Hebrew can mean angels, but for the most part, malach means messengers, okay? So what we have here is we have a ladder reaching from heaven to earth, And we have messengers traveling up and down, not just going up, not just coming down, but going both ways. These are messengers, okay? What is the purpose for them going up and coming down? What is the purpose? Why why are they going up and down, up and down? Because messengers carry a message, exactly. Messengers carry a message. They go up, we receive the message, we come back down. And we bring the message down, not just because we heard a nice little sermon up in heaven, then we go home and we take a nap on Shabbat, and, and then we go back to work on Monday and never speak of it again. Okay? Our ability to connect the kingdom of heaven to earth is the focus of this chazon. It's the focus of the vision that God has for us. This is a prophetic vision of what God expects of us. Okay? Is there a beginning and an end to the ladder? A beginning and an end. No. There's no beginning and there's no end. 
the messengers continually go up and down. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Continually. If you don't go up, this is another something. This is important to understand. It's a process. If you don't go up, you can't be a builder of the kingdom. If you don't go up, you have to go up, receive the message, get the vision, and come back down. Okay? I've, I've, I've stated before, okay? I've stated before that we are breakers. We are the breachers of the wall. We are the, I'm sorry, we are the repairers of the wall. We are the ones who, who repair of the streets. We have a responsibility. God has a responsibility for us. And our, our responsibility, and just bear with me on this, sometimes these things are, are a, little, a little hard to hear because of our previous understandings, our, our previous uh, teachers, okay? But we have a responsibility to hasten the geulah, the redemption, okay? A lot of people have a problem with that. A lot of people say, what do you mean we hasten the redemption? What does that got to do with us? I believe it has everything to do with us, and, and I, I believe the Apostle Peter will back me up on that. Okay? We have something to do with hastening the redemption. Okay? The bridegroom's not going to come back till the bride's ready. The bride has to be ready for the bridegroom to come back. So, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Okay? So he's saying, this is the day of the Lord. This is the, the great and terrible day that has been prophesied in, in the prophets. Uh, and, and in the Torah, and he's saying this is the day. This, the heavens will pass away. The, uh, everything will burn up with a fervent heat. He says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, since all this is going to happen, the Lord's going to come back. Redemption is coming. He says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the day, the coming of the day of God. How many of you didn't know that was in there? Okay. Peter says very carefully, number one, what persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the, the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Okay? So he's saying, according to our conduct, our holy conduct, uh, living in godliness, looking for, and we have responsibility in our lives by our conduct, through the Torah, to hasten the coming of the day of the Lord. We have responsibility. You know why she was not coming back yet? Because we're not hastening it. We're not doing a good job as his followers to keep the Torah, to, to, to have the word break out through the land. Are we changing anybody's lives? Are we changing lives? Are we, are we investing our lives in other people? Are we doing aravut? Are we taking responsibility for other people's lives to invest in their lives and, and how they're living and, and people are having problems, divorcing and, and um, uh, all kinds of problems and issues when we can come alongside and say, hey, let me show you what God says about this in love and in compassion and, and in mercy with people. Or we just say, nah, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm busy. i got a lot of things to do. So in our holy conduct and, 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 and living in godliness, we can hasten the coming of the day of the Lord through what we are doing. It's the, person, uh, it's the purpose. It's the chazon that God has given us. Okay? We have an obligation to bring down the kingdom of heaven to earth through the connection. That connection is the latter. What or who is the ladder? 
Yeshua. Yeshua is the latter. He said so as much in John 1.51. And he said to him, most assuredly I say to you. And he's talking to Nathaniel. Nathaniel was underneath the tree. And he was, uh, he was reading or studying his books. And uh, uh, was it Andrew? Goes to him, tells him, said, look, we found the Messiah. And he comes to him comes up to him and said, you know, surely you're the, uh, and, and Yeshua tells him, he says, look, I, I saw you under the fig tree. And he says, oh, you're, you're the Messiah. And he says, well, you say that because uh, I just, you believe that just because I said I saw you under the fig tree? He said, you'll see greater things than this. He said, he said, and he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Okay, so Yeshua tells us right out. He's the Sulam. He's the ladder. He's the ladder in which the messengers, the Malachim, go up and they come down. Okay, this is a direct reference to the Chazon of Yaakov. This is a direct reference to the vision of Jacob. Okay, the vision of the ladder of Jacob. If we follow the vision of the Torah, then Hashem will fill, fulfill the vision that he has for us. You see, God's covenants, as much as we've heard to the contrary, are conditional. They are conditional. If you do this, I will do this. Those are, I mean, not the, the covenant with Abraham, but I'm saying like uh, the covenant with Moshe, um, and, and other covenants, I, I'm going to get into all of them right now. But basically, it is conditional. He says, if you fulfill the vis vision that he has, for, uh, if, if we follow the vision that God has set, then he will fulfill his vision for us. If we are bringing out the message of the kingdom of heaven to those around us to hear on earth, then God will hasten the day of the coming of the Lord. It all works in tandem, okay? So where in the Torah is the first place that we see hastening, okay? Every concept, if, if, you're, if you're new to, to Beth and I, new to, new to teaching, I'm, I, I say this as often as I can. Anything that is in the New Testament is not new. It's just true, okay? It's not new, it's just true. You won't find one word that Yeshua said that you will not find in the Torah, he may have explained it on a deeper level. He may have gone into a different level of interpretation. However, he never said anything different than what the Torah says. So the first place, when, when especially Peter, when we're talking about uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, about hastening the day of the Lord, we see all the way back in Genesis chapter 18, Brashit 18, and it's Avraham Avinu, our father Abraham. Okay, he is our great example. Uh, maybe I, I kind of touched on it last year a little bit about Avraham Avinu and how it is that Shaul uses Abraham as a reference point to our faith. Abraham was very, very important in Paul's theology, and there's a reason for that. Um, that's that's in another teaching. Again, you can find that in the archive. But we see the the first idea of hastening. In Genesis chapter 18, the Hebrew word is vaymacher, vaymacher. Abraham ran in everything he did. He hastened to fetch the food and drink. He ran to meet the, the messengers who were coming down, down the road. This word for hastening, vaymacher, occurs almost a dozen times. What is he doing? He not only did it to them, but he did it fast. And he did it with a purpose, okay? That is a pattern for us. We see in the pattern of Abraham, uh, Abraham Avinu, our father Abraham, a pattern on how we are to approach things. What was Abraham doing? He was doing mitzvot. He was doing uh, good deeds. He was doing commandments. He was showing achnasat uh, orchim. It's hospitality to those who came near his house. Not only did he do it, he did it with fervency. He did it with purpose. And that is a pattern for us 
in how we approach our service, our avodah Hashem, our service of the Lord. Okay? So the ladder and our ability to climb it, our ladder and our ability to climb it will unlock the kingdom of heaven. Again, who is the ladder? The ladder is Yeshua. How do we climb the ladder? How do we do that? How do we climb the ladder? Hmm? Prayer? Prayer's a, a pr- prayer's definitely an av- avenue. Studying Torah. Torah is definitely a way that we can go up the ladder to heaven and, re- and get the message and come back down. Okay? Why do I say that? Because if Yeshua is the Torah made flesh, we study the words of Yeshua because he explained to us the meaning of Torah. Right? The word made flesh, back then there was no Brit Chadashah when he came back. There was only one word, and it was the Torah. He is the Torah made flesh. How do we know this? Because he kept all of the commandments of God absolutely perfectly. He set aside any will that he had in order to follow the will of Hashem. What is the will of Hashem? It's his Torah. The word Torah. Direction, instruction, teaching. That is his will for us. That's what he wants us to do. So in order to climb the ladder, we do the things that Yeshua did. We follow the words that he commanded us, and we go back to the Torah and study the Torah, that is where we're going to get our message. Okay? Our message doesn't come from some esoteric uh, transmeditation technique. It doesn't come that way anymore. Not, I'm, let, me, let me back up before I say that. God gives a person a word to share. God gives people's understandings. But his will is in the Torah. It's set in the word of God. Okay? It is set in the word of God. <clears throat> so in order for us to get the message, to ascend up the ladder, we follow Messiah Yeshua. Paul says, let that mind be in you that was in Messiah Yeshua. What mind was in Messiah Yeshua? The Torah. <laughs> Sounds like I'm beating a dead horse up here. But they all connect. All of them connect. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, the Son of God, the Father. It's all one. There is no differentiation between any of it. They all have the same purpose. And that is the will of the Father. And He has given us His, he has given us his will in written and in flesh. He's given it to us. Okay, there's one God, there's one Spirit. If you want the Spirit of God in you, put the Word of God in you. Pretty simple. If you, if you, if you memorize His Word, you study on a day, daily basis, then you will walk in the Spirit and not according to the flesh. How am I going to commit adultery if I just memorize the verse from Exodus chapter 20 that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery? How am I going to do that? How am I going to do that if I just memorize the verse from Exodus 20 that says, Thou shalt not murder? Then I'm not going to, uh, I shouldn't. Um, sometimes we, we have it because we have free will and we're selfish. We do things we ought not to do. But the point is, is the more we get the word of God in us, the more it will work its way out of us. Right? You've heard the, you've heard the saying, garbage in, garbage out. Well, word of God in, word of God out. That's how it works. We want to walk in the Spirit. Let us study the words of Torah. Let us ingest the words of Yeshua, and therefore it will work its way out in um, work its way out in our lives. Uh, me and my wife and, and another friend of mine used to joke all the time. Uh, you know, you you get these little emails and you get these little Bible study devotional things. Five minutes a day. Just five minutes a day, and, and you're good. Have your devotional, and then you go on about your life. It takes me five minutes just to get my books out <laughs> anymore, just so I can study, because I want to understand and hear from God what he wants in my life, what he wants me to change, what he wants me to do. Um, it takes more than five minutes a day in order to accomplish that. All right, Miss Karina, can I have my first slide, please? All right, so I want to make a connection here. 
and, and who we are in Messiah. We're talking about the Sulam. The Sulam is the ladder. Uh, and you'll be looking at it. Sulam is going to be the word on the right because Hebrew is read from right to left. Okay? But in English, that word is going to be on the left-hand side. So the word Sulam in Hebrew, in Gematria, anybody here not know what Gematria is? Okay, Gematria is the, uh, it is the study of numbers. Okay, each, each Hebrew letter has a number value to it, from 1 all the way up to 400, and then you just combine the different letters to make different numbers. Okay, so in, in Gematria, uh, the, the word Sulam, it's a Samech, a Lamed, and a Mem. And Sulam is, if you do the Gematria, equals 130. Take each letter has a number value, you add all the numbers together, it equals 130. So gematria is the study to take certain words, concepts, and, and, and find out what else has the same value and how they connect. connect. For instance, the word nechash, it's the word for serpent we find in Genesis uh, chapter 3. The nechash, the serpent was more wise than any, any beasts or creatures in the field, right? Well, the word Mashiach, Messiah, has the same gematria value as Nachash, 358. So the, the, the rabbis, the sages ask them, what's the connection? Why is there a connection? Well, two things. Number one, what was, when, 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 when the children of Israel were in the camp and all these serpents came in and started biting them, what was Moses to put on a pole and hold up in the air and what is it they had to look at in order for them to be healed? The serpent. It's the Nachash, right? The Mashiach brings healing. He brings rectification. Okay? That is one connection. Another connection is that the Mashiach is going to come and rectify the sin of the first Nachash. He's going to rectify that sin. He's going to bring a tikkun to the world, a restoration. Okay? So this is how, this is how Gematria works. You find something that has the same values. You find the connection uh, to it. Not everybody believes in it. I'm actually rather convinced. Okay? Sulam. Sulam equals 130. The next word, Sinai. Okay? Sulam, Sinai, and the last phrase, Zechese Hachavod, the throne of glory. The latter represents or is equal to Sinai. What was given at Sinai? The Torah. And through the Torah, where do we end up? Kiseh HaChavod, the throne of glory. That's where we go. We ascend the ladder. We ascend the ladder through Yeshua, through the Torah. We study. We get to the throne of glory. We get the Chazon. We get the vision. Then we come back down and we share that with others. We bring it to our community. We work together as a community to bring about the chazon, the vision that God has, and that is for people to put their own side, uh, own will aside. Accept Yeshua as their Messiah for their sins, and then bring about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, right here on earth. Okay, having established all that, we come to our second occurrence. <laughs> that was just the first occurrence in Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, having established all that, we come to our second occurrence of the phrase in Messiah in our text. Okay, if you'll read with me in verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Messiah. Uh, I think all the way back in the very first installment of this series, I said something along the lines that we were actually going to get to this verse and understand what it means about being seated. No, I take that back. That's another, that's another one. Strike that from the record. Okay. Uh, just in this one verse, this one verse, there are six aspects of divine blessing. Six aspects of divine blessing. It's the blessed one, who is God. Okay? It is the blesser, also God. It's the blessed ones, 
who are the believers. It's the blessings, all things spiritual, the blessing location, the heavenly places, and the blessing agent, Yeshua the Messiah. Okay, so we've got six aspects of blessing in just this one verse, okay? Attacking the first one, the blessed one who is God. How can we bless God, right? Uh, if, you, if you notice in the text, it says, Blessed be the God of our Lord, uh, Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. That is somewhat very close to the call to worship that we do right here in the synagogue at the beginning of our service. It's called the Barhu, right? Barhu et Adonai, Hamvorach, bless the Lord, the blessed one. Okay? Paul probably has that in mind when he's writing this particular verse. Okay, so how do we bless the Lord? We say this every week. Bless the Lord, the blessed one. How do we bless the Lord? And I run across this as very interesting. You'll find it in the overview of the complete art scroll Siddur, uh, overview of prayer. It relates this story. It says, The Talmud relates a story about uh, Rabbi Yishmael Kohen Gadol when he was in the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. Okay? Hashem asked him for a blessing. He replied, May it be your will that your mercy conquer your anger, that your mercy, mercy overshadow your attributes, and that you behave toward your children with the attribute of mercy, and that for their sake you go beyond the boundary of judgment. And that is a uh, passage in the Talmud from Berchot 7a. This passage is astounding for what it both says and what it does not say. Uh, what did God, why did God need our Yishmael's blessing? Why didn't Rabbi Yishmael comply by just blessing God, just you know, praising God for how wonderful he is, how good he is? But when, when God asked for a blessing, Rabbi Yishmael says, let your mercy overshadow your attribute of judgment. Why did he do that? Why didn't he just bless God? How does a request that God treat Israel kindly constitute a blessing of God? Okay? He asked them, ask God, treat us kindly. How does that constitute a blessing? What do we give God when we bless him? And next slide, please. Okay? The Rashba derives the word bracha, blessing, which is going to be on the right, bracha, blessing. He, he, he derives the word bracha from the word barecha, which means spring. A spring flows constantly and its waters increase. Okay, so when we bless God, we are proclaiming our hope for an increase. But of what? God himself is infinite, right? He's without beginning. He's without end. We cannot dare suggest that he can grow beyond what he is. While it is true that man cannot grasp God's essence uh, even to the minutest degree, we never le nevertheless can perceive him as he relates to us. Okay? We can't know everything about God. God is infinite in all of his ways, all of his essence. Too big for us to understand. However, God has not left us without a way of knowing him personally by the way we relate to him. Right? The prosperous society sees him as the beneficent God. The afflicted individual smarts at God's judgment. The Torah scholar thrills at Hashem's wisdom. Or man can be so nasty and brutish as to think that power comes only from the barrel of a gun and prosperity from the blades of a harvester. God's degree of revelation in the universe is in direct proportion to our spiritual capacity to receive it. Very important. When Israel was at its zenith, God revealed himself on Mount Sinai in unprecedented splendor. When Israel sank into spiritual confusion, he was so concealed that Israel wondered whether, he was, whether it was still his nation or not. Right? So our understanding of who God is is directly related to how close we are to God. How, how much we devachut, uh, how much we cleave to him, how close we are to him. 
Okay? God desires man's perception of him to deepen and the degree of his revelation to increase. That's what God wants. We're talking about chazon. We're talking about vision. We're talking about revelation. That's what God wants. He wants us to receive more revelation of him. And that only comes by devachut, by cleaving, by coming closer to God. We have to get rid of the spiritual junk that prevents us from coming close to God. Okay? When we sin, we now have opened a gap for spiritual forces to work in our lives. We've given the enemy the authority to start operating in that gap and where we are, and all that does is is all that does is serve to push us further away from God. Okay? Uh, the, the sages tell us this. They said the reward for a mitzvot is a mitzvot. If you do a commandment, you do a good deed, the reward for that is you'll get an opportunity to do another good deed. He said, but the reward for a sin is another sin. The rabbis will tell us this. They say that once you sin, it's hard to stop doing it because now you've opened the door to for spiritual forces working in your life that will try to push you towards doing that sin and separate you, separate you even more away from Hashem. But the commandments, on the other hand, bring us closer to God. Okay? And the closer we get, the more revelation we receive, more chazon, more of the message that we share about Malchut Hashemayim, about the, the, the kingdom of heaven. Um, so since this is his wish, that we cleave to him, come closer to him, and increase, uh, uh, and his will is for the revelation or the chazon to increase, since this is his wish, he, he is pleased, he is blessed when man makes it possible for this to happen. Accordingly, whenever a person prays or blesses God, he plays a part in carrying out his wish to display his presence in the world's affairs. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. God wants us to come to him to ascend and then descend so that we can display his will, his revelation, his goodness, his awesomeness to the rest of the world. That's what God desires for us. So in this sense, Rabbi Ishmael Cohen Gadol thus gave the ultimate blessing. The outcome of successful prayer is to, make, to permit God to come closer to you, to restrain his anger, show his mercy, to respond to our attempts to serve and sanctify him by allowing his love to squash his attributes of judgment. Rabbi Yishmael wished for the desired result of the prayers, the increase of God's presence. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I love that. Uh, the second aspect of blessing in this passage in Eph is Ephesians 1 is the blesser, okay? And I'm going to have to stop here because I can't believe I just went an entire hour and I've still got like three or four pages left. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not slides, just, 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 just words on my, on my, uh, on my, on my Kindle. Okay, so the second aspect of this passage in Ephesians 1, verse 3, is the blesser. Okay, Yahweh, James reminds us that every good thing bestowed and every perfect good uh, gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. Shaul assures us that God causes all things to work for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He didn't say some good things. A few good things. He said all good things to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Okay? Our God is a good God. He, he only wants good for us. He desires to bless us. He desires to see our success. But our success is direct, directly in proportion to the amount of closeness we have with God. Again, all of this ties together. There is no source of goodness outside of God. Why do we even bother looking sometimes? As, as human beings, sometimes we think we can find some good in that thing over there. We're going to find some good in that thing over there. Let me eat just one more piece of pie because it's so good. You know, let me, let me have this one other illicit relationship because it's just so good, right? No, it's not. 
Why do we continue to follow after things that are not good? Only God is good. Yeshua said, why do you call me good? There's only one good. It's our Father who is in heaven. Okay, so God blesses us because he is the source of all blessing. Goodness can only come from God. Therefore, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And I, I want to jump right straight to this. Uh, and that is the, uh, the location. No, the blessing. These are spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings. What can we say about spiritual blessings? We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Okay, Whenever the word pneumatikos in the Greek, spiritual, is used in the Brit Hadashah, it, re- is, it is in relation to the working of the Ruach HaKodesh. Okay? We're talking about blessings, and that, that is the, the spiritual blessings. Pneumatikos always refers to the Ruach HaKodesh. It's always the Holy Spirit that brings these, these things. Okay? Spiritual refers to the source, not the extent of the blessing. Okay? Spiritual refers to the source. Believers ask for many things from God. We, we, we continue to ask for many things from God that he has already given us. He's already given it, yet we're still asking. All right? They pray for, for, uh, for God to give them more love, although they should know that the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Ruach HaKodesh, within our hearts who was given to us. Okay? Romans 5.5. 5. We pray for peace, although Yeshua said, my uh, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. John 14, 27. We pray for happiness and joy, although Yeshua said, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. It's been given to us. It's been given to us. All we have to do is actualize it. His joy, His peace has been given to us. We don't have to ask for it anymore. We just have to actualize it. We have to manifest it in our lives by ascending the ladder, descending the ladder, which is Torah, which is Yeshua. Okay, 2 Peter 1, 3 should come to mind. It says, His divine powers grant to us everything, everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. Okay, everything means everything he's given to us by his power, by his divine glory. It's been given to us. And the last thing, the location of blessing. These abundant, unlimited blessings from God are in the heavenly places. The heavenly places encompass the entire supernatural realm of God, his complete domain, the full extent of his divine operation. Okay? We have a paradoxical existence as believers. We have dual citizenship. We are here on earth, but we're citizens of heaven. Okay? And everything that, that we have access because we're a citizen here on earth, guess what? We have access to everything because we're citizens of the spiritual domain. We're citizens. We are seated in the heavenlies with Messiah Yeshua. What does that mean? We are citizens of heaven. And having the, uh, the uh, citizenship of the heavenly or spiritual authorities give us heavenly and spiritual authority. That is why we can... Yeshua told the disciples, go out and cast out demons. Heal the sick. Why? Because he gave them the spiritual authority to do so. If we're seated with Messiah Yeshua right along with them, we have the same authority. We've been given the authority to do these things. Are we accessing it? More often than not. Okay? So, I just want to conclude this saying that this is uh, just another aspect of who we are in the Messiah. We have a purpose, and that purpose is to, to unite the kingdom of heaven to the earth. That is our purpose. Okay, and this is only done when we realize that we have a responsibility to be a breaker, a poretz, to climb the ladder of Mashiach, reach the throne of glory, and bring a tikkun, a rectification, to the world beginning with ourselves. It starts at home. It starts with numero uno, number one. And then 
it reaches out to our family. Then it reaches out to our communities and everybody else that we have influence in. You don't have to go halfway across the world and preach to 400,000 people. It's in the lives in which you have your influence, and it starts at home, and then it branches out from there. Uh, Thank you for joining me. Uh, Come back next week, and I'll try to have something ready for you next week. (laughs) Shabbat Shalom.